right, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for uh, for coming to my talk um, and for uh, for all of you who voted for it to be the best. Thank you for subjecting me to this. This is great. <laughs> um, if you want to vote for my talk again, here's this slide. <laughs>
kind of look a little bit more like this. <laughs> That's great. Follow Square Trek on Twitter. Best. So good. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a very real thing. Um, especially when you work in a large or mature code base, and especially as we continue to push toward this like zeitgeist of um, microservice oriented in, uh, infrastructure, um, achieving a speed up of 30% can be a monumental undertaking that can require the concentration of a ridiculous amount of resources and the coordination of many disparate teams, sometimes may not even be in the same country. So, my value prop for y'all is to focus on this objective simply because it offers a better bang for buck. As front-end developers, we can operate alone and achieve a meaningful difference in the perceived speed of our apps without having to worry about any objective or physical speed up that would require the dedication of resources necessary to make a 30% improvement on uh, objective speed. So, in order to figure out how we can do that, we have to learn a little bit about how people perceive time. So people tend to break events that occur over periods of time into active and passive phases. Active phases are characterized by high levels of mental activity, and passive phases are characterized by like a high level of, of twiddling. Um, uh, and the, the, the crux of it all is that humans tend to overestimate passive weights by 36% per Richard Larson of MIT. Um, and we've all been there, and we've all seen this. Um, I know this happens to me, and I do this all the time. I'm so guilty of this. Uh, Google Maps tells me, stay on the free lane road, sit your ass in traffic, and get stopped up at stoplights, because I swear to God, it's two minutes faster. And I'm like, fuck you, Google Maps. I'm not going to sit in traffic listening to that Lady Gaga song again. Uh, I'm going to scoot around on side streets, and I'm going to wait at stop. I'm going to wait at stop signs, and I'm going to wait at stoplights. But it's going to be fine because I don't feel miserable, and it always sometimes feels faster, even though I know in my heart of hearts or head of heads that it's not as fast. Um, and you see the same thing even in tasks that you don't necessarily associate with that, like ordering tacos. If you consider the beginning of your taco ordering experience as the moment you sit down at your taco table, and the end of your taco ordering experience at the moment you receive tacos, do you even really think about the time that you spent hemming and hawing between whether you're gonna get fish tacos or al pastor tacos as part of the waiting time? I know that I don't, and I'm guilty of hemming and hawing about that all the time, because like, we can really decide. Um, but no, what I perceive as the waiting time is the passive wait of after my order has already been submitted, just waiting for my food. So not only do people think of, uh, or people perceive passive waiting time as taking 36% longer, but active waiting time sometimes doesn't even feel like waiting at all. So armed with that information, we can really do two things. We can work to make passive phases feel less long and feel less terrible. Or we can take our total activity and work to make active phases a greater proportion of the total time. So there are like my four favorite ways to get this done. And there, are, there are many others, but this is what I feel kind of like the low hanging fruit and the most accomplishable ways to get most of the way to this goal. Um, uh, one, you can respond to users immediately, which um, gives apps a nice um, present and tactile feel and engenders in users the expectation that um, the app is looking after them and the app is right there with them. Um, give users a sense of certainty in terms of how long the waiting period is going to be and how much time has elapsed and how much time is left to go for them. Um, occupying users' attention, uh, keeping their focus off of the wait and on something else, maybe not even related. Um, and focusing on rendering minimum viable layout, identifying what that is and rendering that first. So you're getting people out of a passive waiting phase where they're staring at a spinner or a progress bar or a blank screen and into something interactive as soon as possible to shorten the passive phase and lengthen the active phase that it takes to load the entire page. So let's start about on, uh, on immediate response. 
So Jacob Nielsen of the Nielsen Norman Group conducted this study in 1992, which has then been subsequently tested and confirmed over and over and over again. And one of the findings of this study is that it takes about one second for users' flow of thought and like stream of consciousness to be disrupted. So to put that in another way, um, when they take uh, an action that is asynchronous and it's going to cause some waiting time, it takes them about one second to eat to naturally transition from focusing on the task they just accomplished, whether it's like clicking a button or completing a form field or whatever, and it takes them that one second to realize, okay, now I have to wait for something. Like, okay, the app has not immediately responded to me. I'm waiting for something now. So if we know that it takes them one second to even realize they're waiting, we need to work to respond immediately so we can front load as much loading as possible into that one second when they don't even realize they're waiting for something yet. And my personal favorite way to do this is to load things on mouse down events or touch start or touch down events uh, versus click events. Um, so one of the tricky things about click events is that um, when users make the decision to click, they first push their mouse button down and then the mouse button comes back up again. But yeah, right? Totally mind blowing. Um, <laughs> but what, what was kind of mind blowing to me when I found this out is that click events don't fire when the mouse button goes down. They fire when the mouse button comes back up again. And there's a not insignificant gap where the user has made the decision to push down their mouse button. And that mouse button has been held down, but the click event hasn't fired. They've made the decision to click, but the app hasn't done anything yet. And if you switch to mouse down events, you can take advantage of that gap. So we can see how long it is here. I made this little demo here. Um, and I'm just going to click this button, and it's going to show me how long I've held the mouse button down for before the click event fires. So 120 milliseconds, 189, 112, 112 again. Whoa. That was pretty crazy, super consistent. Um, and I tested this um, on Mechanical Turk, and I found that it was pretty common that uh, a 150 to 150 milliseconds, people would hold their mouse button down. So that means that by loading content, or making the decision to start whatever asynchronous process we're doing to load stuff uh, on mouse down instead of click, gives you a 100 to 150 millisecond head start. This pairs really, really well with uh, active states in our CSS. Um, if you don't know what active states are, they work just like hover states, only instead of firing when you hover an element like this. Um, that's weird, because my hover state isn't working. That's strange. But um, instead of working, instead of firing when um, when you hover the when you mouse over the element, they fire when you click down on the element. Like here's my active state here. It turns a darker shade of pink and moves down. And um, through this mechanical Turk research, I found that. The sweet spot for animation duration is between 150 to 200 milliseconds. Because if people tend to hold their mouse button down <coughs> for 100 to 150 milliseconds anyway, that by pushing the duration of our active animations a little bit past that, we can coax them into holding their mouse button down for the entire length of our active animation, which gives us a little bit more time that we can front load our loading before people realize they entered the loading state before a click event fires. Um, giving users certainty. So uh, David Meister, who is, um, God, I can't remember what they call him. He's called like Colonel Q or something. He, he's this business person that has spent all of his time studying how customers queue in lines. Um, and he has some kind of like weird colloquial title for that, I don't know. Um, but he postulated that uncertain waits, waits where people don't know how long they're going to be waiting for, feel longer than waits where people are given an indication and given certainty about how long they're expected to wait for something. And this has been subsequently <coughs> proven in psychological studies over and over again as being an accurate thing. And the easiest way for us to do this is with progress bars. <laughs> <laughs> but progress bars aren't just as simple as like this shitty one that Reveal.js gives us where it's just going down the, down the page because uh, animation plays a big role here, and it can make a tremendous difference in terms of how fast a progress bar is perceived to load. So here's a quick demo, and this is a progress bar with no other animations other than it's simply filling from left to right, just a normal progress bar. Um, a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon named Chris Harrison, Chris Harrison um, showed that by introducing an animation of counter animating bands, bands that animate down the length of the progress bar in the opposite direction that the progress bar fills 
can make the progress bar feel like it fills faster. And this is like kind of an obvious thing when you think about it. It operates on the same principle as when you're riding a train and another train comes whizzing by and you look out the window and it feels like you're going twice as fast as you're going because you've got the other train sort of uh, visually amplifying your speed. Um, and in a subsequent study he found that simply by applying an ease in to that animation so that the bands continue to speed up over the length of the progress bar as this one does, that it goes faster still. And he was able to attach a number to it in his study and he found that uh, progress bars with accelerating bands feel like they feel 12% faster. And so if you remember the 20% just noticeable difference threshold with time, with objective time, just by introducing a progress bar with counter animating bands, we're already halfway there. And we haven't had to touch any microservices. We haven't had to write any server-side code at all. We just threw a progress bar on our app with bands that have an ease in on the animation. But don't overdo it. Progress bars are easy to use, which means they're easy to abuse and overuse. Um, so if you expect your waiting time to be less than one second, don't include a progress bar at all. In fact, don't include a loading indicator of any kind. If you recall the Jacob Nielsen study that said that it takes like a second for people to realize that they're in a waiting state, and you display a loading indicator right away without giving them time to process, you're yanking them out of a, uh, an <coughs> active state where they're focusing on the task that they just completed and putting them into a passive waiting state where they then have to stare at a spinner. So if you hadn't included this and you know that your action is gonna take less than a second, they never would really process the wait at all. It would just kind of seem like the app is responding immediately and everything's gone here. When there are things you can do in the configuration of how your assets are handled, or your images are minified, that you actually can achieve these objective speed ups. But if that's going to use an unreasonable amount of resources to get there, that's when we start needing to consider about attacking perceived performance first and optimizing for that. Um, rely on data to make sound decisions. Uh, remember that your users are different and that while the statements that I've made here describe a representative sample of human internet users, the users of your individual app may not be a representative sample of humanity. So you need to use data on your projects in order to make these decisions. So you are crafting solutions that fit the needs of your users because really that's what perceived performance is all about. It's about taking the focus away from uh, the hard and the technical and the objective and the observable and making it on behavioral patterns and focusing on the users, which really as developers, especially front-end developers, that's what we're really here to do. Thanks.
Um, but for the Super Sense, uh, they didn't want that data to say they thought about it or they saw a mistake, and now it's been saved and now it's been updated, and they didn't know. Uh, so it seems like you kind of have to pick your spots. Um, yeah, you, have, you absolutely do have to pick your spots. And um, okay. in terms of like if we're couching this in real data, like I feel comfortable using predictive design, especially when the calls are not super heavy, like not three megabytes, um, where like sort of the the risk is low, like the, the risk of like serious adverse effects are low. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel comfortable making those decisions if it's 85% or more of users. Like, if I can look at my analytics, find heat maps, and understand that this pattern applies to 85% of users, I'm gonna use predictive design on that because I sort of look at our jobs as serving users, not user. And if we are um, creating a more positive experience for an overwhelming majority of users and a slightly more detrimental experience, even though it's not necessarily detrimental, mm -hmm. um, certainly not if they're um, on, a, on like Wi-Fi or a wired data connection where they won't be charged for the data, um, I'm willing to take that risk. I guess I was thinking more like a, if you if they're placing an order, let's say, then I, that's something where you say let them click. Oh that's, yeah, that's no, if, with if, if you're trying to transmit data to a server, like if you're trying to do like predictive design on key down. Like you don't want them to like, have their username recorded as ah because the first letter they typed was A, right? Yeah. So that's more for loading assets that are necessary to display gotcha. forms. So like if you're if it's a sign up form that has a payment thing at the end, there's a lot of specialized client side JavaScript necessary for validation, and there are assets for like the little icons for your credit cards and things like that that all have to be loaded. And you can load the assets necessary to render the next step if you're not necessarily transmitting data to the server on what the first steps like fields read. Does gotcha. that make sense? Yes. Okay. So uh, we frequently, uh, like in terms of what when we try to make changes and reflect to the front end of our product, we're frequently like tasked with like we have to basically validate that the changes work in terms of like return on investment, basically for time spent. So with the nature, time, of, I'm sorry, time spent for you or time spent for users? Time spent for us, like okay. as developers to, to make the changes. Um, so with all of these things like inherently being non-objectively timed, they, like how do you how do you show that value to say like the development manager or the product owner to make the case that it's worth the time whenever you don't have a solid like we're gonna get it's gonna increase load time to right. So you need two things. You can lean on generalized psychological data, which applies to a representative sample of humans. Like uh, the just noticeable difference threshold of 20% has been studied over and over and over and over again and it continues to hold up. That's uh, same thing with uh, humans tend to overestimate passive waiting time by 36%. That's been tested over and over and over again and is like a, a it's like the law of gravity of psychophysics. Um, and you can point to that data. Um, and if you have the luxury to do it, um, conduct user tests. A, B, test it, and ask for sat ratings of satisfaction. Um, I don't know if your user base is large enough for that or if you have the resources to do that, but the more close conversation you can have with your users, the better. For more than just this, too. Well, all right, thanks so much for coming, guys. I really oh, no, one more, one more. Everybody <laughs> sit down. <laughs> Predictive design and error recovery. You predict that user will do it, and you start loading your loader, and user decided not to. How do you recover? Um, well, going back to what I said earlier, and should have made a clear point of during my uh, during the presentation, um, we're not necessarily transmitting data to a server in terms of the completion of step one of a form flow. Or what we want to do is load the assets necessary to um, render the next page. So I wouldn't ever, if, if you're trying to like record user information and stick that in a database somewhere. It's simple, it's showing the bug. I decided to change what you show in the bar. So oh, so like when, in my demos, because the bar that was happening on the, on the left side. Yeah, because it's just visual, right? So that was a sort of behind the scenes notification for just us in this room of what was happening uh, behind the scenes with the app. So that was uh, what I wanted to include as an indication so that you could see that when I clicked the button in the first demo, that's when it started to load, and it was an indication so that you could see that when I started working on the third form field and all of the form fields had input in them, it would start loading in the background. So that was just a background loading indicator for us to make that experiment clear. 
Um, in terms of predictive design, you want to be loading that information when they don't realize that it's loading. So you wouldn't show a progress bar in that case. What you would do is when you would show your progress bar when users make the decision that, okay, I'm going to go to the next page by clicking the button. They don't realize, and nor, nor do they need to know, that you're loading that information in the background. That's just a way for us to get a head start. So you would only display your progress bar once they click or once they take their action. All right, well, thanks for coming, coming everybody. I really, really appreciate it. You were officially bribed with three stickers. <laughs>